Uh, I'm Andrew Claven. I got the worst possible mark in every class in Hebrew school. And my father used to say, they can't flunk you out of being Jewish. But I came very close. I came very close. By the time I was bar mitzvahed, I was so completely estranged from this entire tradition, I didn't want to do it at all. It meant nothing to me. I gave in. I had to. I was forced to be bar mitzvahed and say these things that I didn't believe. So I ad-libbed the, the Hebrew in my bar mitzvah because like, I really had barely learned the portion of the Torah I was supposed to read. I was making up Hebrew words to get through it. I was <laughs> just anything, anything I could to get through. And at that time, when you had a bar mitzvah, people just piled presents on you. Savings bonds, money, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of jewelry that I got from my bar mitzvah. And I put it all in this big leather box, which I also got from my bar mitzvah. It was the first time I had ever had anything, any wealth that was my own. I was 13 years old and I was very excited by it. And so I had this box and I would keep it in a little closet, a little pantry kind of closet in my room. And every now and again, I take it out and just kind of stare at this. I never wore a lot of jewelry, but I would just stare at this wealth that I had accumulated. But over the course of let's call it the next six months, the joy of this wealth started to seep out of me. I began to feel that I had done a truly hypocritical thing. These are ill-gotten gains. I was bought off, you know, I, I let someone give me money to say what I did not believe. I kind of naturally had a sense that God was there, but I hated the hypocrisy. I hated the fact that I'd been bullied into something. I hated the fact that I'd been bought off. And it started to dawn on me that it must have been very important to me that I had lied about God specifically. And one night, I waited till the entire house had gone to bed. And I took out this box full of thousands of dollars worth of jewelry. And I crept outside and I stuffed it in the garbage because I felt so bad about it. And I remember stuffing, I can feel, even whenever I talk about it, I can feel the broken eggshells and the coffee grounds on my arm because I shoved it down deep because I was afraid somebody would find it before they would throw the garbage away. And in the morning, the garbage men came and they took the garbage and this jewelry and they threw it away. And that was meant to be the end of my religious life. I loved stories. I wanted to be a writer for as long as I can remember. I love tough guy stories because I didn't because I didn't get along with my father. I needed a male role model and I turned to stories like by Ernest Hemingway and the tough guy detective stories of Raymond Chandler and uh, the Maltese Falcon by uh, uh, Dashiell Hammett, you know, these tough uh, detectives. And I, I, I thought these are the kinds of men I want to be like. This is the kind of, these are the guys who walk in, the, in a corrupt world, but they carry this kind of integrity inside themselves. As I studied literature, I realized that Jesus was at the center of all of Western literature. I, I, should, I should find out about this. I should find out about it. I went in my, into my bedroom and I closed the door and I started to read the Gospel according to St. Luke. One of the funny things about the Gospel is that people have this concept of gentle Jesus, meek and mild. If you can go into the Gospel and find a place where gentle Jesus, meek and mild exists, I will pay you to see it because Jesus is a hard man. He walks in to these, death, you know, these deadly situations. Even when they're threatening him with death, he just says what he has to say. And that to me, especially in this world of lies, that to me is so important, such a great model for any man. And my father uh, liked to sabotage anything that I did. So like if, if he heard me writing, if he heard me typing, he would always break in on me and try to mess up my concentration. And so while I'm reading this, he walked in without knocking. He threw open the door and he caught me reading the gospel according to St. Luke. Now you have to think about this for a minute, right? I'm 15 years old. He could have walked in on me with a girl in the bed. I was doing that. But he walked in on me reading the gospel according to St. Luke, and he was furious. I mean, the rage came out of him in little bits because he was trying not to let it out, but it kept bubbling up out of him like hot tar, and he couldn't stop it. He was cursing at me. He was using, you know, foul language, and, and he would just keep, he would keep bursting out. And we went in to have dinner, and we'd sit down, and it kept coming out, and it kept coming out. And I'm trying to explain to him, I'm not reading it for religious purposes. I'm not reading this for religious purposes. I'm reading it for literary purposes. I just wanted to know what all these guys were writing about. And he pointed his finger at my nose and he said, if you ever convert, I will disown you. I'll disown you. 
There was only one ambition that I had. I wanted to be a novelist. That was what I wanted. I applied to the University of California at Berkeley because it was so far away from my New York home. And I went in to the first of my terrible, terrible depressions. I called them the, the bola because they were like that throwing thing. It would just kind of appear out of nowhere and wrap itself around my throat and choke me with this sorrow. And I was torn up. I was so broken and crazy inside that I didn't understand how to communicate with other people, how to write stories. I knew I had a talent for writing stories, but I couldn't write stories that people liked because I, my mind was so messed up and I was so full of rage and, and twistedness and, and uh, you know, it, it didn't appear. I wasn't like a, a crazy person. You looked at me and you would have thought, well, he seems like a really, you know, all put together guy, but I was not. I was really broken inside. And I didn't know I was going insane. I didn't realize I was going mad because I, I had that romance of the intellectual, an intellectual is miserable, an intellectual faces things, he, he looks, he tells the truth, he looks life in the eye, and life is meaningless, and life is death, and because he sees these things, he's a man of sorrow, and so I just thought I was a typical intellectual, you know, it's uh, like that song, uh, it's, it's hip to be miserable when you're young and intellectual, that's what I thought I was. But I was in so much pain, I did begin crying out to God in this kind of sick, superstitious way, I mean, I remember, you know, trying all these kind of spiritual experiments to try and get clear. I published a novel when I was about 26, and the book didn't sell, I couldn't publish it, and it just died. It was such an experience of grief, I didn't even feel the grief. And I just started to unravel. And at the same time, my wife became pregnant. I'm trying to write and I'm picking up a little bit of money, but we're slowly going broke and I'm slowly going crazy. I'm just going crazy. My books became unreadable. My writing, I'd always prided myself on this clean, clear American prose, you know, and suddenly I was writing these convoluted sentences that nobody could understand. I not only couldn't uh, sell my books anymore, I couldn't even get an agent. I couldn't do anything. I was just frozen. I was so depressed. I was in my bedroom and my wife was outside. Sometimes she would sleep on the couch so I could work in the bedroom because that's where my desk was. My little baby daughter was in her nursery. I was drinking, not heavily, but I was drinking a, a scotch and I was smoking cigarettes and I was thinking about killing myself. I had had suicidal thoughts before, but this was, this was different. This was the real deal. I was sitting there thinking, I don't know how to live. I, I do not know how to live. And there was a radio playing a baseball game, the Mets game. And um, it was just playing in the background. I wasn't listening to it. I was just sitting, I was, I was thinking about throwing myself off the roof because we lived in a, I don't know, an eight, 10 story building. And I was just thinking I could just walk up there and everybody would be happier. My wife would be better off. My daughter would be better off. I don't know how to live. In the baseball game, the Mets had a player that I just loved named Gary Carter. And Gary Carter was a devout Christian and whenever they would interview him after a game, you know, how did it feel when you hit that home run? He would say, oh, praise G Jesus, you know, <laughs> Jesus, I, I'm so happy I hit that home run. And I used to think like, oh, Gary, stop, you know, it just went right up my spine. It was like, it was like somebody had dropped a worm down my back, you know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And after the game, I'm sitting there considering suicide, drink in one hand, cigarette in the other. And after the game, Carter won the game by beating out a single to first base. In other words, he hit a ground ball and he ran so fast that the throw was late and he got to first base before the throw, which was amazing because Carter's knees were gone. He was a catcher and he spent all this time squatting. He had terrible knees. So after the game, the interviewer came up to Tim and said, how could you run so fast when your knees are so bad? And if Carter in that moment had said, Jesus, 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 I wouldn't have heard it. I, w I was no way ready for that. I was. I, God, I had pushed God completely out of my life. But he didn't. What he said was, sometimes you just have to play in pain. I remember thinking, I heard that and I remember thinking, well, I can do that. I'm a tough guy. I'm, I've always been a tough guy. I can, I can play in pain. And that was the answer. How do you live? Sometimes you gotta play in pain. I think about that a lot these days and that this Christian ball player, who was clearly given these words by God to speak to me, that he didn't use God's name, that I wouldn't have heard God's name, that God 
that the king of the universe <laughs> put himself out of the picture to reach me. Uh, that's, you know, a kind of humility that you don't see in a lot of uh, people. Anyway, that was the last time I ever thought of suicide. I was reading a book, a, a sea adventure story, great book. I love Patrick O'Brien, great author. At the end of this chapter, it said, uh, his name was Matron. It said, Matron said a quick prayer and fell asleep. And I thought, well, if he can say a prayer, because he was a very intellectual character, I really loved him. I, it was a series of books, and I just really identified with this character. I thought, if he can say a prayer, I can say a prayer. Now, here I was, my career was going great. I had married this woman I just adored. I had two children I just adored. I was so happy that I had come through this period of, of pain and uh, emotional breakdown and had changed everything in my life. And so I said a three-word prayer. I said, thank you, God, and I went to sleep. The next morning I woke up and everything had changed. I was suddenly more alive. I suddenly saw everything more clearly. I had been trying to see things clearly since I was a little boy. I remember as a child thinking, I can't get past my daydreams. I can't get past my own thoughts. And suddenly, there it was. There it was. Everything was beautiful. Everything, my wife, I could see my wife's face. I could see the coffee in the cup. I went out into London, one of the most beautiful cities on earth, and I could see the city, and it was all clear. And I realized it was that prayer. It was those three words. Three-word prayer. And it was kind of a an intellectual experiment for me, but for God, it was the lifeline that he needed. It was the connection he was looking for. What I had been looking for in my life as a, as a writer, as an artist, I had been looking to be directly connected to life. You can't be directly connected to life until you're connected to God, because God is the source of life. Not just the source of life from the beginning, from creation, but the source of life right now, right this minute. And you can't know God, he's just too big for the mind, unless you know him through Christ, who is a man like you. I was connected to the world. I had life in abundance, that great promise, that great promise, I want you to live, and I want you to live abundantly. You know, my father was afraid that by embracing Christ, I would be leaving Judaism behind, but weirdly, I never really felt connected to my Judaism until I found Jesus. When I when I found Jesus, that was the first time I started to think, oh, oh, that's what all that stuff in the Bible meant. That's why, you know, there were those traditions. That's why there, was, there were those passages that never meant anything to me before. I always had a connection with my cultural Judaism. I always knew I was a Jew, was happy and at peace with that. But I never understood the religious aspects of it until Jesus came into my life. It's absolutely true. Until I was baptized, I don't think I was a Jew. And it has been just a remarkable, remarkable adventure. I, I don't even know uh, how to communicate the, the way all of life makes sense now, the way, it, it, you know what it is? It's the difference between sailing in absolute darkness on a stormy sea and sailing in darkness on a stormy sea, but you can see the North Star so you know where you're going and suddenly the storm doesn't bother you, suddenly the darkness doesn't bother you because you know exactly where you're headed and you've got that star to lead you. And uh, I think that's my testimony, guys.